Good morning, everyone. Welcome to noon, Noontime Prayer and the reading of Psalm 33. Really glad you're here. I hope you can connect. I saw that Randy and Terry were having a hard time connecting. I hope you get that resolved. It's a kind of cloudy day here. It's been another quite a week. I appreciate all your prayers. Let's continue to pray for our friends overseas and the soldiers overseas. Let's begin with prayer this morning. Kind, kind and heavenly Father, just give you praise for this day. I thank you that we get to live today. I thank you for breath and beating hearts and the wonderful flavors of food, the, the wonderful smells of life all around us, roses and the smell of dinner being prepared. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow, no shifting shadow. First, Lord, we pray for our friend overseas, for his wife who is in a coma. who has taken a turn for the worse, we pray for her that you would bring complete healing to her body and, and to her brain, that you would bring her out of the coma, that you would, she might have a sudden uh, return to health by your spirit, Lord. And we pray for the rest of the family for healing. We pray for your watchful care over all of them, Lord, for encouragement for our friend, and for the rest of his family, Lord. We pray that you'd give them a very, very special sense of your presence with them. I also pray for the soldiers, Lord, that you would watch over them, keep them safe. Give them grace, Lord, the power of your grace and the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. And Father, I, I turn to the pandemic. I, I looked at the numbers today from the CDC, and this is the largest uh, increase of new cases in quite some time, 34,000 new cases. And I know there's debate about the reliability of their numbers, but even on their own web website, they say that their numbers cannot be accurate precisely. Father, we know that numbers are rising rapidly in Florida, in Texas, in Arizona is the hot spot right now, and also in Nevada, Lord. In, in um, I think it's northern Nevada, southern. southern Nevada. And so we pray for each of these states. We pray for wisdom for the leadership. Uh, for the governors, for the Senate and the House of Representatives of each of these states, for their health departments, Lord. I pray that you would bring us out of this pandemic, Lord. I pray that they would be able to develop a vaccine or an antibody that can treat it. Yet, I also pray somewhat fearfully, Lord, that take this cup from us, but not as we will, but as you will, Lord. This world that you so love, that you so love that you gave your only son, we're plunging ourselves into ever greater darkness, thinking that you won't notice or you won't care or you will be silent. So many of the things we took for granted, now we can't do. How, 
how will our world return to a state of normality or Lord, I'm so thankful that you are sovereign. That you are in control. That you are our shepherd. We shall not want. I thank you that you make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. Lord, you're the one who restores our soul our mind, will, and emotions. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. For you yourself are with us. Your rod and your staff used to beat off the enemies and to rescue us when we've gone astray or done something stupid, your rod and your staff, they comfort us, Lord. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies, the sat satanic hosts that are bent on stealing our witness, soiling our witness, stealing our joy. Creating anxiety in, in place of the peace that passes all understanding. Yet you prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. Our cup overflows, Lord, with blessings and goodness and love and joy and peace and hope, eternal hope and faith. You anoint our head, heads with oil, Lord. You anoint us with the Holy Spirit. You fill our lives just by our asking. You're sitting on the edge of your seat waiting to fill our lives. Your son Jesus said, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So today, Lord, we ask for an extraordinary infilling of your Holy Spirit in each of our lives today, tomorrow, this week, next week, this month. But each day will come, Lord. Simply ask that for ask for that or for which you desire to give us, Lord. Your word says ask and you'll receive. Keep asking and you'll receive. Keep seeking and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. And yet that keep asking is asking for the Holy Spirit. That keep seeking is to seek his presence. And to keep knocking is to keep knocking on the door until the Holy Spirit opens the doors that you would have opened in our lives. So Father, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. And surely your sheep dogs of goodness and mercy chase us all down through life. When we get off that path of righteousness, your sheep dogs, dogs come nipping at our heels. Not in a bad way, but to get us back onto your righteous path on which you lead us. Thank you for your sheep, do sheep dogs of goodness and mercy. And Lord, you've promised that we shall live in your house forever. And we're already there, having believed, having entrusted our life to Christ, having invited him to take up residence in our life. Teach us to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit. Teach us to live as dead men and dead women. For your Spirit spoke through Paul and said, we have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer we who live. But Christ who lives in us. And the life we now live in the flesh, in this corruption of the flesh that's still with us. We live by faith. We live by trust. 
in the Son of God, Jesus, who loved us and gave himself up for us. When we are confronted with our earthen, earthenness, our weakness, our own sin, our own failures, may your spirit remind us to look away from ourselves and to look to Jesus and remember two things, that he loves us and that he loved us so much and loves us so much that he gave himself up for us. Thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you for the power of your grace. Thank you for eternal hope. Thank you for understanding peace, understanding surpassing peace. Thank you for the joy of the Lord. I pray also that you would bring peace to our nation, reconciliation. The only way I know how that's going to really happen is through a great awakening, Lord, of people in this country and a revival in your church. So, Father, we pray that beyond our own workings and our own striving, we can't do this, Lord, but you can. So we pray that you would bring a great awakening and a great revival, not only to our nation, but around the world. Bring justice, bring peace, bring salvation, bring redemption. Bring the full knowledge of the one who has so loved us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome again. I'm glad you're here. My wife is sitting here with me. Uh, my mom was a little bit tired this morning, so she's in her room. And my daughter's uh, going to be staying at uh, her sister's house for a while while she returns to work. So we're going to miss her. This whole pandemic brings a lot of changes to our life. I know it's brought a lot of changes to my life here. Today we're going to be reading Psalm 33, and so I'll read through it. And then I'm going to go back through and just work through it one verse at a time. So let's read it together. I'll read it. It's purported to be a psalm of David because of its uh, where it's situated in the psalms, but it has no heading. And so I'm not sure this is a psalm of David. We're not told. And so any trying to make any pronouncement of it is a speculation. Psalm 33, verses 1 through 22. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. <clears throat> Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his works, work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in the storehouse, in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitant, inhabitants of the world Stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. 
A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness, to, de to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. <clears throat> so again, we don't know who wrote this psalm. It has some common themes with the psalms before it. So that's why people say, <clears throat> excuse me, That's why they say it um, belongs to David. I tend to go with what's actually written or not written in a text. And so let's begin. Sing for joy to, in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. I love where this psalm begins. It begins with a prescription to praise. There are five commands in this psalm. The first one is sing for joy. The second one is give thanks to the Lord. Third one, sing praises to him. The fourth one, sing to him a new song. And the fifth one, play skillfully with a shout of joy. I checked it out. All of these are commands. So we are commanded, well, the Israelites were commanded, and us secondarily, are commanded to, to praise the Lord, Yahweh. And as we've seen so many times, this is that most holy name of God, his forever name. It is described in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, I believe. And it's the name that's connected to I am who I am the Lord, the Lord. It's also the name that we find in Exodus chapter 34 when Moses has asked to see Yahweh's glory. And he says, I can't show you my glory, but I will cause all my goodness to pass before you and I will proclaim my name to you. And then he passes by and says, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth and so on. So it's that name. And we know that when Jesus came on the scene, as I've said before, he said over and over again, or throughout the book of John, I am, to the woman at the well a couple weeks ago, when she mentioned that they were waiting on the Messiah, the Samaritans were waiting on the Messiah. Jesus said, I am the Messiah. And so he not only claims to be the Messiah, but he, he said that he was Yahweh, the Lord. Uh, again, the capital letters are there because they didn't want to profane this name. So anytime they came upon this name, instead of saying Yahweh, they would read Adonai, the Hebrew word for Lord. And when the Greek Septuagint translated it, they used Kyrios, the Greek word for Lord. And so we've carried that tradition on to this day. There are some Bibles now that are putting in Yahweh. And so that first command, commandment, sing for joy in the Lord. That's not a command to us or to the Israelites to only do when things are wonderful. It's a command to sing in the worst of times. So oftentimes when we have memorial services, we sing praises to our God. We sing for joy in the Lord. So that first command is to sing for joy. Sing until joy rises up in your hearts and replaces the grief, the, the sorrow, the fear, the mourning, the anxiety, the worry. And it says, sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. I love this because throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, we've been doing this 
Bible study called The Descent of Man. And that's really the story of the Hebrew Scriptures, is the story of the descent of humankind. I call it The Descent of Man because there was a, a landmark book written in, I think it was the late 70s or early 80s. I first encountered it in probably 78, or it would have been the, early, the late 70s or mid 70s. It was written by Jay Bernowski and it was called The Ascent of Man. And the idea was that man is getting better and better. Well, the Bible teaches something entirely different. We start with the perfection of the garden. Adam and Eve choose to disobey God's one commandment. They could have done anything else. No law, just one commandment. Don't do that. Don't eat of that tree. And what did they have to do after they were tempted with Satan or by Satan? It was they did the very thing God told them not to do. And they plunged the human race into the sin in which we still find ourselves. And this descent continues. You have Cain killing Abel. And then you have the descent into the flood until God destroys every human being on the planet, save eight, Noah and his family. And then he starts over again, and within a short time, we come to the Tower of Babel in chapter 11, and he has to disperse the uh, people all around the world. He confuses their languages for fear or for concern, not fear, but for concern of what they will be able to attain apart from God in their wickedness. And then after that, he deals with us individually or corporately in our groups, not as a whole, not as a whole world. Sometimes he deals with nations and he puts nations away. Sometimes he kills off whole families, like in Achan's case when he disobeyed God. They found Achan by lot. We see through Abraham all the way through Isaac, Jacob, the 12 brothers who were totally sinful. You get in the, into the judges, the time of Joshua and the judges. They disobey God repeatedly uh, in, in allowing people to live or allowing towns to live. Uh, in the book of Judges, there is this cycle of going after other gods, going after idolatry, and then crying out to God after God would send a, a foreign oppressing nation. And that goes through the entire book. Then they call out for a king and Samuel's disturbed and God says, don't you get concerned about this because it's me they're rejecting as their king. And they give him Saul and Saul was a disaster. And then along comes David, whom God says, a man after my own heart. And that would mean a man after God's own mind. So that would mean that God, David was a follower of the law. He was a follower of the covenant that was made with Abraham and with Moses. And yet, David ends up breaking just about every one of those. And upon repentance, he then allows the rape of Tamar, his, his daughter, to be unchecked. He doesn't do anything to uh, Ammon, who committed the, the, the rape. And then there's Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. And he breaks all three commands that God had commanded the kings not to do. Don't amass gold for yourself. Don't go after large numbers of horses and chariots or chariots from Egypt. And don't go after foreign wives because you'll go after their idolatry. You will, you will be consumed with their idolatry. And what did Sol Solomon do? He had 300 wives and 700 concubine. He amassed for himself huge numbers of horses and chariots from Egypt. And he amassed for himself huge amounts of gold. As a result of his disobedience, the kingdom was uh, divided, and we have Israel to the north that never had a righteous king, and Judah to the south who had only four righteous kings. And finally, they both got so bad that in 722, God allows Israel to be carried off by the uh, Assyrians, never to return until our generation, for the most part. And then in 586 BC, Judah was carried off. And so if I'm reminded of the words in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who seeks God, no one who understands. To 
Together we have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So when I read this, sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. The only way we can get there is by the righteousness of Christ given to us as a gift. And then it says praise is becoming the upright, to the upright. So if you are living this righteous, that word upright is another word for righteous. It says that praise is becoming the upright. And so now that we've been made upright in Christ, all from God, then praise becomes us. To praise what God has done, there's nothing that we have done that we can, we can claim as our own. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. I love this. In the praise hymn battles of the probably the 80s and 90s, it was always organ, piano, or guitar, bass, and so on. And here we have the command, give thanks to the Lord with the lyre, which was the guitar of their day. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings, another stringed instrument. I really don't think God is concerned about the type of instrument we use. It's the quality of our praise that we are singing out his wonders, singing out his awesomeness, singing out his glories. Sing to him a new song. I like this. Don't just sing the old songs. Sing to him new songs. Keep, be creative. Keep creating new songs. I know that there are people who say all these praise choruses are so repetitious. and Sometimes there's a line that you just want to say over and over again. Nothing wrong with that. And in every generation, there's this huge amount of music that's created. And out of that music will rise to the top the best songs of that generation. And they will be kept for the years to come, just as the hymns of their day came out of a huge amount of music that had been pro produced, most of which has been lost to hymn books in dusty shelves. But I love, love that, sing to him a new song. Some of the songs I, I so love are Raise, an Allelu Raise a Alleluia, Reckless Love. That takes some explanation because God's love, God is not reckless, but his, uh, his love appears to be reckless. It's the taken from the prodigal son. I think about songs that came out, Shout to the Lord when it came out. Or, I can sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Now they seem old hat, kind of worn. And then lastly, the command, play skillfully with a shout of joy. Don't, don't play with me mediocrity. Go for it. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. When was the last time you heard a shout of joy in church? Maybe if you're in a Pentecostal church, you hear it all the time. But we don't often hear a shout of joy. So we begin with praise in the psalm, commands to sing and to praise. To, what is praise? To tell of the wonders of our God, to sing his glory, to remember the, his kindness, his loving kindness, his grace, his peace, to tell in song what he has done and who he is. And then moving on. <clears throat> So we begin with praise, and now we move into word, his word. And in that day, it would have been the Hebrew scriptures, what we know as the Old Testament. They began as the Hebrew scriptures, not our scriptures, but they are our, our scriptures. But for us, it would include the New Testament, all God breathed, including Paul. Sometimes we make Jesus and his words kind of a canon within a canon. And yet Jesus says in Acts 9.15 or thereabouts, he said, Paul is a chosen instrument, uh, instrument of mine to bring my message to the Israelites, to the kings, and to the Gentiles. To the Israelites, to the kings, and to the Gentiles. That about covers it all. 
And so the Holy Spirit speaking through, through Paul is giving me the message of the risen Christ. And so it's not of lesser importance to the Gospels. The Gospels have the message of the of Jesus clothed in flesh, speaking to the Jews under the law. Paul and the rest of the New Testament has the words of the risen Christ, speaking the truth of the gospel in all clarity. And then it says, for the word of the Lord is upright. It's just, it's good. There's nothing false in it. It can be trusted. And all his work is done in faithfulness. And so notice word and work, word and work. It, it draws on the imagery coming from creation. We'll get there in a minute. But when God works, he speaks. And his speech is work. It performs things. It creates things. It creates human beings and planets and stars and galaxies and the universe. And all of his work is done in faithfulness. It's always good. And God saw that it was very good. There's no du duplicity in God, no falsehood. It's all done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. Oh, that our world today and our nation today would learn this, that he loves justice for all people. He loves righteousness. Our world is chasing after anything but righteousness right now. Our nation is. I can count the ways, and it gets really quite disturbing and distressing to think of all the ways that we have gone against what God says. Even the command to multiply and fill the earth, we have turned into the command have abortions and deplete the earth. We do it over and over again in so many ways. Hear those words. He loves righteousness and justice. Well, we know that we can't be righteous in, our, in, our, in of ourselves. And in a sense, we can't be just in, our, in of ourselves either. Because we can, apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And so we humbly come to the Lord and ask that he would fill us with his righteousness and his justice, and that his justice would come down rolling like a mighty, mighty river. And I love this next line, line the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. Loving kindness is that word hesed in the Hebrew. Got to say it with clearing your throat a little bit. Hesed. And it means long-suffering love, loving kindness. It can mean covenant love. It's the love that God uh, promises in making a covenant with a nation or a group of people or with us. And it's long-suffering love. It's love that he never gives up on us, that forgives, that pursues us, that gets us back on the right track. I know there are people in my life that over time, I really haven't given up on them, but I've just, they've just kind of drifted away. They lose interest. They stop following the Lord. They, they pursue a sinful path. And having so much time, I'm, I fail. but God never gives up on us. We all struggle with this. But get this, the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, everywhere you step, I'll be watching you, no. Everywhere you step, you're stepping into his loving kindness. Where can I go from his spirit? Where can I go from his loving kindness? He never gives up on you. He loves you to the bitter end, even to the cross. And then we 
get this word and work again. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And so we have word and made, word and work. And it's bringing up that wonderful image from Genesis, all of Genesis. God said, let there be light. God said, let the waters be divided from the dry land and so on and so on. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And again, that word Lord is Yahweh. And so we know it's Jesus. And we come along in John chapter 1. And the word was with, was with God. Let's see, how does it go? I don't have my Bible here. Where did I put it? Oh, here it is. I'm going to butcher it. So let me uh, actually read it to you. So here it is. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's speaking of Jesus. And so he was in the beginning. He was in the beginning was a word. He was there at the very beginning. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so in the mystery of the Trinity, He is both with God, and in the fullness, He is also God. And through Him, all things were created. At the beginning of Genesis, we read these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, so there we already have the Trinity in, in part, and the Spirit of, of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, then the Word spoke, let there be light, and there was light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we move ahead way over to John, 1st John, let me get there here. This is like regular church where we have to look things up in our Bibles. Here are these words mirrored from Genesis to John chapter 1 verse 1 through 1st John 1 1 and following. What was from the beginning? What we have heard what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, the wounds in his side, the wound in his side and the wounds in his wrist or hand, they called the whole thing as his hand, concerning the word of life. And the life, Jesus, was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. We proclaim to you the eternal life, Jesus, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may, so that our joy may be made complete. He's asking people who are, have departed from believing the truth to return to fellowship by returning to the truth about God. And so here we have, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. As we have learned more and more about the vastness of the universe through using the Hubble telescope and other kinds of telescopes, it's an enormous universe. It's beyond anything I can understand. Just some, some of the stars are so big that I can't comprehend their size. And get this, by the word of Yahweh, by the word of Jesus, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Last night, Nancy and I and Mom and Nicole went out on our front driveway. Mom can't get out the back stairs down to our backyard. So we have this little fire pit that our, that our good friends, the Coleman's, gave to us. Just a little metal one with a grate on top. And so we set it out in the driveway, and I built a fire, and we brought chairs around. Of course, Mom had to be 
five feet back. We put her a little bit further than that because she's on oxygen. And we sat around enjoying uh, a summer fire, like camping, but just in our driveway. And we had marshmallows and s'mores, and I can't eat them, but I had a roasted hot dog. It was wonderful. And then I looked up and I could only see a few stars. We who are city dwellers lose out so much of the wonder of God's creation. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts, all that vastness of space, we're told in Psalm 139, I think it is, that the entire universe can be measured by the span of God's, of, of the Lord's palm, by Jesus' palm. He's a big God by, by God's palm. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps into storehouses. When I stand at the ocean and I look at the power of, an, of the ocean, a tidal wave, that tidal wave that hit Japan, I watched many videos of it hitting the coast and even coming up way inland and hitting inland cities because of the rivers. And nothing could stop the, the power. It just came very slowly and rose and pretty soon the entire city was burning on and on fire because of the gas line breaks and so on. And yet he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses, meaning the rain clouds and and this goes right in line with also Genesis chapter 1. And then moving along, it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord, because he made it. He made you and I, and so we need to give him reverential fear. It's not the fear of punishment kind of fear. It's that fear of awe, of when you're at the ocean and they, they have a sign up that says, Beware of the riptide currents. People drown here all the time. No swimming. Well, you're not going to catch me going into that ocean. Uh, not doing it. I'm sorry. I have a great respect for the ocean. And in the same way, we need to have a great, awesome respect for the Lord, for Yahweh, for Jesus. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. There's that reverential fear. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand. And notice this is going beyond the nation of Israel. We're talking about a global perspective now the entire world let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him and i don't see the world standing in awe of him through the lie of evolution believing that we have come from nothing boy that's a hard hard one to believe that everything came from nothing period without a first cause without a god who spoke things into being from nothing No, let's pray that all the inhabitants of the world would return to standing in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. By his word, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things came into being through him. For he spoke and it was done. What power is there in being able to speak and it creates reality? It creates a physical reality. It creates human beings and animals with this intricate design and DNA. We make our God out to be so small sometimes. We leave it all up to ourselves to do everything. It's by our programming and by our missional works. And, and I'm not getting, I, please don't hear me wrong. I think those are good things, but so much, so many times we rely on that instead of God himself and what he can do. It says, unless the Lord builds his house, the builders build in vain. And he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And then it says, the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. Think about the counsel of the nations right now. He frustrates the plans of the peoples would that include our nation and our peoples when we are running away into sin? He nullifies. What does nullify mean? To do away with. Count as nothing. Jesus nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the people. Just as he frustrated the plans of those building the Tower of Babel. He frustrates our plans as well when we make plans to depart from him. 
Hitler was going to build a kingdom that lasted a thousand years, the Third Reich, the third thousand years, or a, th a thousand year reign of supposedly this Roman type empire. And how long did his empire last? 20 years? I, I'm not exactly sure. He started coming into power in the early 30s, and by 45 it was over, so 15 years. As we plunge ourselves further and further into sin as a nation, will he nullify our counsel? Will he frustrate all the plans of our people and peoples? And then in contrast to our, the counsel of the nations and the plans of the people, it says the, count, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. His guidance, his plans, his wisdom, his, his, the course that he sets, it stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation, and that word heart again means mine, not the plans of his emotion. That's our reading. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. So every generation sets up plans against the Lord, sets up plans, um, counsel against the Lord, the wisdom of the ages. In our day, it's just believe in yourself. You don't need anyone but yourself until some disaster happens in your life and you find out how weak you are, how wholly incapable you are of doing much of anything. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, she who abides in me and I in her, she it is that but bears much fruit. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't think we wrap our heads around that. I think we read and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every breath I take, every beat of your heart. And so in contrast, you get this contrast. Where do we look so often for our solutions? We look to politics, both sides, all sides. We look to the workings of humankind, our plans. And the first place we should be looking is to God. To his counsel. What is God's counsel to us in the middle of this pandemic? What is God's counsel to, uh, to us in the middle of this racial injustice? What is God's counsel to us in the, in the face of all this violence and the anarchists? What is God's counsel? What are his plans for our nation? We forsook these so long ago. And get this, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Shouldn't we be finding out what God's counsel is, the Lord's counsel, Jesus' counsel? It stands forever. I think about psychological theory and social theory. The things I studied in college are now so passe, they're probably not even mentioned. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart, of Jesus' heart, they stand from generation to generation. His plans are always the plans that outlive history. Hmm. Isn't it wise to be, become fully acquainted with his plans and his counsel? We can ask, Lord, show us your counsel. Let us know your counsel. Put us in line with your plan, Lord, and reveal it to us. And then we continue verses 12 through 15 of Psalm 33. It says, Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. And we know that this is spoken of Israel first. But notice in, in the section below, it's speaking of the inhabitants of the world. So when he says these words, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord, he's talking about any nation who would make God, their God to be Yahweh, to be Jesus. 
I think historically this nation was actually the Constitution was crafted by Presbyterians, and some of you hate Calvinists and Presbyterians um, because of doctrinal differences. But Calvinists, because of their view of total depravity, whether you agree with that or not, this is historical fact, they didn't trust human beings, and so they crafted a government of a, of ba of a balance of power. So they crafted a government that had the Supreme Court, the judicial branch, the executive branch with the president and, and his cabinet, and then the legislative branch of the Senate and the House. And the Senate and the House were, were supposed to make laws. The president was supposed to approve those laws and then execute those laws and govern the nation with the budgets that the, the Congress gave him or her. And then the judicial branch was meant to say whether those laws followed the Constitution or not, period. That was how they set it up. Boy, have, has that changed. But I have to acknowledge that with slavery, I've been reading a book called The Essential Writings of the, uh, the American Black Church. It's 880 pages, and it has just writings from the, Ameri from the American Black Church. Just pages into it, I've, I've been left in, in tears. It's, it's going to be a hard book to read because it puts, us, puts me in full contact with our history. And so even in the beginnings of our nation, we fought for freedom, for liberty from the British, but we neglected to give freedom to the African Americans who were brought here and sold like animals. Things are improving. We've got a long way to go, but things have improved greatly over the years in some sense. And yet, in other senses, here's what I believe. I believe that racism is a sin, among a host of other sins. Until people have changed hearts, and we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and put it to death in us, you can't put it to death in yourself. If you think so, that is the arrogance of the lie, that we shall be as God. No, I, I have to come humbly to the Lord and admit in my life that there has been things of racism in my life, and I'm not groveling in it. I've asked the Lord to put it to death by His Spirit. And when you ask, He does the thing for which you ask. Until our nation and world comes to Christ and asks the Holy Spirit to put this death in us, we can go after all the plans And all the different sins that we, we major in will just repeat themselves. We have the remedy, the cross of Christ. We have the remedy, the cross of Christ, which, bore down, which tore down the dividing wall of hostility. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all on level ground in Christ. We're all on level ground in coming to, to salvation in and through our brokenness. And so it says, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. I get, I, I'm getting really nervous here because our nation doesn't have Yahweh, doesn't have Jesus, doesn't have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the mystery of the one God He's no longer our nation's Lord. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. This gives us direction for which to pray. Return our nation to having you as our God in its fullness. Even in the past, we still failed.
the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Now we're talking about Israel. The Lord looks from heaven. Yahweh looks from heaven. He sees all the men's, the sons of men. He sees all the sons of men, and this would include the daughters of men. There's nothing beyond what he sees. He sees everything we do. In fact, he hears everything we think. If you were to take your, your thought life over the last week and project it up on a, on a screen, it would be horrific it was my, if it was my thought, thought life. And I know it would be horrific it was, if it was your thought life. He sees all the sons of men from his dwelling place. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of all of them. He, in other words, he, he's created all of us. And he watches us intently. He even has the hairs of our head numbered. Every day I clean out some of the, my hair out of the shower. Sometimes I forget to, but I, we have this screen in the bottom of our shower to catch the hair so we don't plug up the drain. And every day he knows how many I've lost and how many you've lost. We make our God out to be so small. He who fashions the hearts, the minds of all of them. He who understands all their works. Well, most of our works are the works of the flesh, which produce that whole list of sin in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 or thereabouts. He has not created us to have e evil minds. We ourselves have plunged ourselves into sin, just as Adam and Eve plunged themselves into sin. And I find these next words so timely. The king is not saved by a mighty army. The president is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory. Is this to say that we're not to have military and we're not to have operations and, and we're not to fight against injustice on a, on a global scale? No, we are. But what, it's, what it gets at is that same command that God gave to the kings. Don't amass for yourselves masses of chariots from Egypt. And so sometimes I think it's not just talking about kings and armies and, and war. Because that was the politics of their day. We live in a strange situation because we have a democratic society and so we are morally responsible to vote and to vote for righteousness, to vote for that which will protect our freedoms. But hear this, the king is not saved by a mighty army, a warrior is not delivered by great strength. Who is the king saved by? Yahweh. Who is the warrior delivered by? Yahweh. A horse is a false hope for victory. In our day, it would be whatever weapons. But I think this is not just talking about war. It's talking about human governance and the use of might to keep in governance. We're all, always looking for human solutions to these problems. We're going to work it out. We're going to resolve it. We're going to fix it. And that's just more of the lie. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped the cr creature rather than the creation. I mean, rather than the creator. They worshiped the creation rather than the creator. And we, we do it all the time. It gets imported into our Christianity. It gets imported into our politics. It gets imported into every part of our life where we look to the human fixes and not to God. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pursue those, but our real line of defense, our only line of defense, is God himself, is Yahweh. Until human hearts are broken, until human hearts are filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, we're going to go from bad to worse. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. That means the watchful, caring eye of the Lord of Yahweh is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. In, under the old covenant, under the 
covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, the word was loving kindness. That was a center kind of focus of the covenant was his loving kindness, his hesed love, that long-suffering love. And that's still with us in the new covenant. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so in the new covenant, we render the word very similarly with grace. We have both, the loving kindness, that long-suffering love, but grace, that undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power, the power of God to forgive, to save, and to transform broken and sinful lives forever. That's grace. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. It says in, I think it's in 1 Peter, set all of your hope on the, on the grace of God, which is to be revealed. There is future grace. Set all of your hope on the grace of God, which is to be revealed. Peter says also, grow in the grace and knowledge. Go, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. And I could add pestilence and calamity and every other thing. And we're talking about, in our context, to deliver our souls from the second death. On those who fear him, on those who have entrusted themselves to his name, who have believed in Jesus who have come and said, I believe in you, Lord. Isn't it wonderful that his eye is on us? The previous section had that he sees all mankind and their works. But on those who fear him, who reverence him, who hold him in awe for what he's done. And I would say for us, it's those of us who have accepted him, who seek to be led of his spirit and to walk in his spirit, who have been born of his spirit through the simple means of believing in Jesus. It's simple. It's not easy. It's simple. It has become so apparent to me this week that believing is not easy. It's simple, but it's anything but easy. And then lastly, we get to the kind of the climax of the psalm. Our soul waits for the Lord. We're very bad at this. We are the microwave generation. As I've said before, microwave popcorn takes entirely too long. I have to wait three minutes. And Abraham waited for what, 30 years, was it? He was 70, I think. Or was it, yeah, and he, he was 100 when Isaac was born. I think it was around 30 years. Methuselah waited for 900 and some, 69 years. I've been waiting on things for the Lord here for ever since I came here. 24 years now, and we're still waiting. He is our help and our shield. In contrast to looking to kings and politics and all the things we do, which I'm not saying we, we need to keep doing it, but we need to have a proper focus and our priorities, priorities made right. And that priority, our first priority is to be citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. He is our protection. For our heart rejoices in him. Our mind rejoices in him. He is so good. He is so winsome. Because we trust in his holy name. And what's his holy name? The Lord, Yahweh, Jesus. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, let that long-suffering covenant love renewed in the new covenant forever. In the new covenant, Jesus cuts the covenant from our side as the perfect rep representative of the human race, God the Father from God's side, and they cut a covenant in the body of Jesus himself. He is the sacrificial lamb, and when his blood is spilt, the covenant is cut, the covenant is made, and we, 
are in Christ our representative. Let your loving kindness be upon us. And now it's, it's an unbreakable covenant because Jesus took all the penalty of the law, all the just requirements of the law into his own body. He took all the curse of the law, which we read in Deuteronomy, I think it's around chapter 19 or chapter 29. I always forget where it is, but it's 70 verses of curse. He took that all in his own body so that there is now no curse in the new covenant, only blessing. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us. Let your grace, let the power of your grace be upon us. That's where we need to turn our focus. That's where we need to place our focus in the middle of this pandemic, in the mis middle of rac racial un injustice, in the middle of violence that is beyond our control. Or maybe within our control. I won't go there. So let me ask you, where are you putting your hope right now? Wherever you are, whatever side you're on, Where are you putting your hope? I want to say in the machinations of man, but I don't remember if that's the correct word, so I won't say it. I just did. In the workings of humankind, our soul waits for the Lord. Right now, in the middle of this pandemic, our souls are waiting for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart, our minds rejoice in him because we trust in his holy name, Jesus. Let your loving kindness, your grace, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. We place our hope in the promise of Jesus. He said so lovingly, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Have you believed? Have you received Christ? Have you been persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, the one through whom all things were created, the one who bore your sin on the cross? the one who has already forgiven you in his death on the cross. He offers you the gift of life, but for the simplicity of believing. We add so many things onto this. We've lost our sight of eternal life as the core of the gospel because we live such long lives now, but I think the pandemic is returning to us The sense of a heavenly solution, of a heavenly longing, of a heavenly hope. Yesterday I was walking with Nancy and just walking along looking at these beautiful flowers in front of some brick houses down by the water. And suddenly this prayer popped in my head. I wrote about it in my Facebook, but this prayer pops in my head. I haven't thought about it in a long time, but it's, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And I used to laugh about it because I prayed this prayer. My parents prayed it with me every night before I'd go to sleep. The last thought on my brain was I'm, I may die tonight. But what a prayer for our day. What a prayer for this age in our circumstances. Over 120,000 people have died now in our nation alone. And I haven't looked at the numbers recently worldwide, but I think it's about a half a million people. I know there's questions about the statistics. Hear these words again our lord our soul waits for the lord he is our help and our shield 
for our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, your grace be upon us. According as we hope, we have hoped in you. According as we have hoped in you. Amen. Well, that's the reading of Psalm uh, 33. Take this psalm out and ponder it. It has great and wonderful truths. And the place we always begin, or the place we begin in this psalm is praise. We're commanded to praise. We're commanded to play skillfully, to play the guitar. And I would include the organ and the piano and any other instrument we can find, the electric guitar, the electric bass. In Japan, some of the flutes, the, those wonderful sounding flutes they have all around the world, different instruments. Ponder my words. Where are we looking to for our solutions? Where are we looking to for the fixes of this world? I'm not denying the need to be responsible in our democracy. Please do not hear that. But where is our real hope? Take out this psalm and read those last verses again. Our hope is in the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Father, I just want to give you praise for that psalm. For such wonderful words that speak so deeply into our situation now. Father, we need changed human hearts who have come under the understanding of the fear of the Lord, who have come under the understanding of the awe of the one who spread out the heavens by your word. The one who crafted everything we see and everything we can touch by speaking it into being. Help us to turn our attention to you, Lord our focus to you. Help us to keep our focus riveted on our Lord Jesus Christ and the life we now live in the, in the flesh. And the life we now live in the flesh, we live by faith, by trust in the Son of God, in Jesus, who loved us and gave himself up for us. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. But Christ, who lives in us. We pray for your counsel, Lord, for an understanding of your counsel that will never be frustrated. We pray for the knowledge of your plans in this generation. We ask this humbly, knowing that apart from you, we can do nothing. Apart from you, we can do nothing. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Actually, our blessing is a continued prayer from Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before you, from whom every family in, in heaven and on earth derives its name, that you would grant us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through your Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to you who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.